Hi everybody, this is an intro to the Quantopian lecture series. So if you're already familiar with Quantopian and with the lecture series, please feel free to skip ahead. Quantopian is a crowdsourced investment firm. And our goal is to democratize quantitative finance and to level Wall Street's playing field by providing a lot of free tools and data of the same caliber that you would run into as a professional on Wall Street. Our business model is to provide capital allocations to the best algorithms that are developed on the platform. To this end, we've developed a pretty extensive educational curriculum to make sure that our users are well educated. The Quantopian lectures are developed in conjunction with and are used for teaching by professors at top universities all around the world. We also work with industry practitioners to make sure that all the examples that we teach are current and up to date with techniques that are actually being practiced in the field today. In general, we try to teach theory and intuition hand in hand so that once you've learned a concept, you have readily accessible code snippets to then go out and apply it. Let's get right into it then and see what we're getting into today. So today we're going to be talking about variance and measures of dispersion. And this kind of stuff is super important just because, well, whenever we're dealing with finance, financial models, or any sort of models in general, it's essential to know how much variance there is, how much uh, of, of these oscillations are present within your data and within your model. Dispersion is a way to kind of measure how spread out your data is around the mean or around the other moments of your data set. And there are a bunch of different ways that we can actually measure this. So we'll start with a super basic one, right? There's this notion of the range. Probably the easiest way to see how far apart your data is is to take the maximum value and the minimum value and just take the difference between them. Now, we don't really use this in day-to-day -day is the thing, just because this is a super sensitive metric. If we have like one particularly high value, this can give us a range and, a, and a, a notion that our dispersion is much larger than the rest of the data would indicate. So this is very sensitive to any sort of outliers that you may run into. Building on this, well, we can build up this notion of the mean absolute deviation, which is essentially this sum of the absolute difference between our data and the mean. And this allows us to capture um, a, a lot more stuff, right? Because then we're going to average out by this end. So for each data point, we see how far it is, whether it be positive or negative. We're agnostic to the side that it's on. And we add all those up, and we, um, and, and we divide it by n, and just averaging that out. And that's how we calculate this mean absolute deviation. So this is, a, this is a, a nice and intuitive way to sort of measure how far we are across the mean on average across our entire data set. But an issue here is that whenever you want to use any sort of objective function to perform some sort of optimization, well, the absolute value isn't really differentiable in, in the same way. So while it may be a meaningful measure, it's not as useful as our classic calculations, variance and standard deviation. So we calculate our variance in a very similar way to this mean absolute deviation from up above. Just instead of taking the absolute value, we take the square difference between our individual values and the mean. And this captures the same agnosticism about whether we're above or below the mean, but a polynomial is differentiable while this absolute value is not, uh, which makes it a lot more convenient to use with other things. So yeah, we, we take these squared differences and we average them all out. So this square is going to uh, kind of blow up any particularly big values, any particularly small values. And the hope is that over time, these are all going to average out. And this gives us a meaningful and interesting notion of how dispersed we are around the mean. So we can calculate the variance in the standard deviation just by using standard NumPy functions. And another convenient thing about the standard deviation, which is just the square root of the variance, and our, our standard deviation is directly relatable to volatility in finance. Whenever we discuss volatility, we mean the standard deviation of a data set or of a time stream or of a time series or return stream. So this is just the direct way that we evaluate the risk associated with any sort of time series. But we can take these standard deviations and look at the proportions of our samples that lie within some number of standard deviations, uh, that number being k. This is called Chebyshev's inequality here. So what we're going to say here is that we have 1.25 standard deviations away from the mean. And we'll calculate this dist value here. We'll calculate our else. 
And we see that these values, given our full set of random integers that we generated up above, these values are the ones that are all within 1.25 standard deviations of the mean. So what I mean when I say within k standard deviations of the mean is, well, these are within the range of the mean mu plus or minus 1.25 times the standard deviation, this 25.887 and so on and so forth right here. Yeah, so, so in general, whenever we discuss standard deviations of the mean, almost the entirety of your data is going to be stored within three standard deviations of the mean. So plus or minus three times a standard deviation around the mean. A significant portion, not, not as much as the three standard de deviations, is going to be encompassed within two standard deviations of the mean. And somewhere around 60%, 65% of your data is encompassed within one standard deviation of the mean. So having a good grasp of the standard deviation in this way allows us to, to, to kind of ballpark where our numbers are going to fall, ballpark how our values are going to be distributed. The final measure of dispersion that we're going to be talking about is this semi-variance and semi-deviation here. And this is very similar to our variance from up above with a few key differences. So I've mentioned a couple times how our mean absolute deviation, how our variance kind of ignore whether we're positive or negative of the mean, right? The semi-variance corrects for that. So this is a very unorthodox calculation of dispersion that you don't see very often. But the basic idea is that, well, we're only going to sum up those values that are less than the mean. So we're only interested, in this case, in the downside of the variance. We're, we're not so interested in the cases where our data is higher than the mean. And all that we do is, well, we basically restrict this set that we're summing over. We take all the x values that are less than the mean, we add, them, we add up these squared differences, and we divide by the total number of x's that are less than the mean. Similarly, well, we calculate the semi-deviation, almost equivalently as a standard deviation of above, just by taking the square root of the semi-variance. So since this is just calculating it around the mean, right, we can kind of generalize this notion to the target semivariance, where instead of checking whether we're below the mean, we check whether we are below a certain target value, b, here. And this is calculated the exact same way as the semivariances right above, just instead of checking whether xi is less than mu here, we just check whether xi is less than b here. And this gives us a notion of how, how, how much is on the downside of this b here. And we can calculate them both fairly easily using Python here. Similarly, the target semi-deviation is just going to be the square root of this target semi-variance of x. So this has been just a few different measures of dispersion that you can run into in the wild, that you can calculate on any sort of data that you may want to handle. And it's important to have a grasp of this dispersion. It's important to see how clustered stuff is around the mean, just because, well, that gives us a notion as to how meaningful our mean is in some way or another. With a lower standard deviation, with less volatility, with less dispersion in general, we're going to rely more on this mean, right? Say this is a return stream, right? And it has a very low mean return, but a very high volatility associated with that return. That means that we're taking out a lot of risk. We're taking out a lot of volatility for a very little return on average. A lot of times in finance, what we'll discuss is instead of looking at the mean return of a time series or the mean return of a strategy, we're going to look instead at the risk-adjusted return. So we calculate essentially a ratio between the mean return and the standard deviation to come up with a notion of this risk-adjusted return, to come up with a notion of the unit of return per unit of volatility. And this is a very important thing to consider whenever we're handling any sort of return stream, whenever we're handling any sort of portfolio. Just because, well, if you're not getting a lot of return per your unit volatility, then it might not be a good idea to invest in that strategy. It may not be a good idea to mess around with that. Just because, well, if you can get a better return for less volatility elsewhere, why would you get something that's less consistent 
on average, that gives you a worse return in the first place. There's this premium that has to come with a higher volatility that we get into in some of the later lectures. But I'll, uh, I'll just leave you with that for now. That's something called the risk premium. And it's the additional return that you get per unit of risk whenever you're handling any sort of strategy or any sort of portfolio. So all of these calculations that we've done before will give you sample statistics on a sample of data. We're trying to approximate these true parameters, but we may not always get there. That's the issue. Like there, there's always going to be some sort of instability with these sample parameters that we calculate. Also, as with any sort of time series data, with any sort of model in, in this case, what we want to be very cautious of is assuming that our sample measure of dispersion is totally representative going forward, right? If we take a standard deviation or a semivariance or, or even a range over a particular set of time, that may not hold if we go forward in time. So that's something to be cautious of, to make sure that you're steadily taking estimates so that you have up-to-date notions of the risk that you're being exposed to whenever you're handling any sort of return series. Yeah, so that's our lecture on measures of dispersion. Thank you so much for listening. Hi, everybody. Thank you for watching the Quantopian Lecture Series. If you have a desire to see any more of our content, it is all available at www.quantopian.com lectures. If you're already on the Quantopian site, you can also get to this page by going over to Learn and Support, clicking on Learn, and then this lectures link will bring you right back here. All of these lectures have a notebook associated with them, which contains the theory and applications for the lecture. It's the real meat. Many of these lectures will also have a video associated with them that you can watch, just like the one that you just watched. And then some of these lectures are going to have algorithms that you can clone and iterate on just to give you a basis to start with your own algorithmic trading ideas. We also have a GitHub, which is at github.com slash quantopian slash research underscore public. All the stuff that's on our lectures page is also here if you dig around. You can also follow me on Twitter at clean underscore utensils. And we also have, last but not least, uh, some resources available for any sort of academics who want to incorporate the lecture series into their classes. All of this stuff is free. We just like to provide a little bit more guidance for professors who want to get Quantopian involved with how they teach. Lastly, you can email me at max at quantopian.com, and that's just M-A-X at quantopian.com. Feel free to send me any sort of feedback, any sort of questions you have about the lecture series. We're always looking to improve things, so we always want to hear comments about how we can make it better. Thank you so much.